Fine, mate. <laughs> Look out if you have a fancy man. So I'd just uh, like to introduce Dave Morgan, who is one of the university's uh, HR managers, and he's going to talk to you about... Oh, you are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's going to talk to you about some of the processes involved in applying for and, and one of the challenges that I'd really like all of us to think about both staff and students is what does this all mean to us our staff, our students as we design, deliver, learn on programmes so it's not just one dimensional what does it mean, that's what we're going to go into next hello there Dave, thank you very much Thank you for that kind introduction. I'm very disappointed to see Stephen coming back into the room. Um, <laughs> on the basis that probably the majority of what I was going to talk at you about this afternoon, in a very sort of didactic style, was the kind of thing that he shared. Um, I've worked at UWE for 15 years. I do do quite a lot of work with recruitment and selection. And I've fairly recently, this, season, this summer, started doing some um, workshops for students in business and law around things like interviewing, uh, managing performance, negotiating, the sort of things that would be really useful skills as part of your process in terms of either getting into work placement if it's competitive or into a job when you're graduating. What I've done was I've cribbed some of that stuff, but actually whether that's really helpful for you, I'm not sure. It's the theory that sits behind some of the processes you'll be going through. What we could do is a fairly quick run through that, but before I start off, is just about everyone in here healthcare student looking to go into nursing or similar? Have we got have we got people from other programmes? Oh, hello. What, what are you after? Sorry, your lunch, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that, that, interesting. So slightly slightly different. So what I've done is if I work through four or five slides fairly quickly, I've then looked for a couple of person specifications, job descriptions online that we could just have a look at and kick around as a group. And I thought I'd ask Rob from the career service to step up because actually quite a lot of what you need to think about is how you're going to sell yourselves in what is a very, very competitive environment. Um, Jerry talked earlier on about having applications up to his hip. Jerry's got short legs. We have, we have jobs where Stephen said we can have up to 80 application forms. So if I'm shortlisting as a manager, I've got all of you people in this room putting an application form down in front of me. It's a Word document. There's no pretty pictures. You've got to differentiate yourself so that I can pick out the four, five, six people I want to interview for the one vacancy that I've got. What is it that you can bring to the table that sells your life experience, your work experience, what else you've done elsewhere, that means that your application will stand out to me? In the context of the fact that Perhaps at UWE we advertise 15 or 20 jobs every week. Not all the same managers, but that's the sort of, that's the sort of churn that we have of jobs. We, have, we do have jobs that go out and we get no applications for. We have some that have very few, but we have some where you have significant numbers and you're in competition. So something about what you are offering on paper has to stand out to me. And as Stephen said, we do try and back away from looking at Joe Bloggs and looking at the fact that they went to school in 1975. We don't have that sort of detail in there if we can avoid it. We're not entirely anonymous in our application forms. Okay, so we will get a bit of a hand along where you're from. We will have quality and diversity data, which is kept absolutely entirely separate and only used for monitoring forms. So, for instance, why don't very many men apply for jobs as lecturers in, in nursing or in, in primary education? And that probably reflects the market because there aren't many people out there actually in practice in those areas. So... Without further ado, what's our own recruitment? We want a suitable pool of candidates. When we're looking at the shortlisting, I want to get the right people through the door so that I've got a chance of making an appointment. It costs us, if we advertise in the Times Higher or the Guardian, somewhere around £8,000 to place the advert. It costs my time and the manager's time to write the advert, to read the shortlist. We've got to attract the right people. The advert's got to be good. Now, there's a big bit in all of this on you guys self-selecting. So, is this the right job for me? So, for instance, if you're talking nursing, I'm not a nurse, but I understand there are a, a number of different, very, very different and separate areas that you could want to go into, whether it's midwifery, whether it's childhood, mental health and disability. You might want to work at Southmead, 
you might not want to touch South Mead with a barge pump. You've got to think really carefully because if you are not committed to this job that you apply for, when I read your application form, I'll pick up on that. And if I don't get it then, you'll come through the door at interview and I will pick up that you're not interested. People earlier commented about how important it is that when you're in the interview, that you know the organisation you're applying for. Again, if I'm taking a judgment between you and you, and you've been online and you can tell me that you has got four and a half thousand staff, and you're looking for a job in HR, and you don't know, I'm sorry, I'm going to go here, because somebody's prepared themselves. Preparation is key, making sure you know what you're applying for. Organisations of the size of you, we can't afford to get it wrong. We have to have as clear and transparent processes as we can so that we treat people fairly and equitably. Again, equality and diversity is about getting the right people in for the job, giving people an equal chance to get on board. And we've got to ensure that we're getting to the right direction where we want to be, making those right appointments, okay? And cost efficient. There's nothing worse for us than going through a whole process and not being able to appoint. In fact, there is one thing worse, and that's appointing the wrong person because we feel we've got to get a body in. That's why the university is stuck with me and they can't get rid. You've got to get it right. Okay, so suitable candidate, who decides, how it's decided. At UWE, we trust the local manager to know, I want one of those, therefore this is the job description, person specification process to recruit one of those. Because I need somebody with that profile as a researcher, as a technician, as a grounds worker, we employ all sorts of different types of jobs. Okay? It's the same the world over. Okay? The job description, you need to read very carefully what's in the job description so that you can prep yourself properly to make this application and sell yourself to me. It should include a wide range of things. Now, don't try and copy all of this down because it'll be published and available. But any job description will have that information. And certainly if you're going to a large employer, they will have these things properly drafted and crafted. And it'll tell you about the working conditions. So is it shifts? Is it nine to five? All of those sorts of things. Okay. This is where Stephen and I will be copying the same graphics, <laughs> which is good. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Now, person the specification. Speed of plagiarism, I <laughs> I've, I've got his name and contact details on the bottom. I think that's how <laughs> Okay, so person <coughs> specification is key in your application. Right. I would say that probably for the majority of you going to big employers, they will want a properly structured application form and you fill in the gaps. And there'll be a bit in there that will say, how do you meet the person specification? And that's where you've got to say, I've been involved in teams in the following way. Now, think really carefully. Often, if somebody's got 10 or 15 years in the workplace, they've got all this experience. You've got to think, what do you have that can be useful. So for instance, with these students in business law I was talking to, I do a session on a Thursday evening, two of them had to leave re uh, early because they're on the committee for the snowboarding society. It's a great experience, you put that on your application form and on your CV. You're contributing more than just being a student, you're doing more than different, okay? But the person specification will tell you what's required, okay? And that's what I'm gonna base my selection on. The person specification should align to the job description. Okay, so for instance, to be a nurse lecturer, you have to be a qualified registered nurse. That will be in the person specification. Okay. I will go through, when I'm looking at your application form, your CV, and see if you tick all the boxes. If you tick all the essential boxes, you're in a great place. Okay. So, again, a receptionist person specification, just as a for instance, just to see what it could look like. Okay. They are presented in different ways. That's the sort of thing you might find in there. There's a different way of describing uh, a person's specification that's coming around now. It's called the competency framework. And it asks you to describe your skills, knowledge, and experience in a slightly different way. Again, based around, to my mind, experience, life experience. When did you do it? How did you deliver it? As opposed to, I can just do it. I'm not sure people necessarily, employers using these things, really understand them yet. Okay. And it's around what you can bring to the job, what you need to deliver the job. If you're going to be, go into a role in politics, what will that be? What skills do you need? And the way that Stephen was talking earlier about teamwork, working with people is essential. If you're going into a job in, in the NHS, in the caring professions, you've got to be able to work with nurses, with porters, with consultants, 
you've got to be able to juggle a wide variety of people, not to mention coping with patients who may be confused, for whom English may not be the first language, or a combination, and people who are in a wide variety of circumstances. So when, I've, when I'm looking through the person specification in the job description, I want you to sell me that you've got that. Okay? And the great benefit for the majority of our star students, particularly ones who are doing the nursing and allied health professions, is the fact that you have the placements. You can draw on that experience. That is absolutely essential. Yeah. I'm looking to see what I can get, and I will have. I don't know how many how many students graduate from nursing in, in UE every year. What you know? Lots. I might have my pick. You'll be in com competition with people that you know. You've got to stand out from them. And the sorts of things, again, Stephen was talking about, and this is from the CIPD, which is the Chartered Institute for Personal Development, um, the sorts of things that people are looking for. And they'll work for any profession, for any role. Okay. And again, it looks at levels. So, for instance, this is civil service. And interestingly, I recently saw an application form for a job with the civil service for the Driver and Vehicle Standards Agency. They're the people who oversee uh, driving tests. Any of you pass your driving tests? Okay. And they also, except for Libby at the back, who's still trying. Uh, oh, you did pass it. <laughs> and, and they oversee things like the MOT for vehicles. Their, their application process, bizarrely, you fill an application form that looks at the competencies. In no way did it say, why do you want to work for us? Okay. It was literally, can you do the job? Completely divorced from everything else. In the interview process, no questions about the organisation at all. I, I don't know how that works. It works for them. It's how the civil service do things. Okay, so now... Can I just... Yeah. Just for that slide, just for last slide. Just as I hand you in, somebody who, like Dave, looks at loads of application forms, sometimes hundreds of thousands, is a real clue on what you need to be told. If you're going for that job, that's some of the language that you need to use. And you need to give us an example of how you do it. How have and where have you managed performance on the section? What did that look like? What was an outcome of that? They're telling you both on that, but on the earlier things they talked about, the program spec and the job spec. So make sure you use the language that the organisation uses. Because it makes me think, yeah, you know what you're talking about. Because you're telling me what I've told you, you're telling it in the back. And if you don't, I have to make a leap. Sorry, though. It's no, no, that's, that's helpful. Thank you, Joe. In a minute, I was going to ask Rob to talk a little bit further about CVs and things, but what, what I did do was I dug out... Um, OK, so if you go on NHS jobs, any number of jobs available that you can have a look through, um, you can then click on the specification, job description, person specification. They're massively long NHS job descriptions and person specs. They're absolutely huge. And towards the end of the... This is what they're looking for you to do. And this is really, this makes life on one level really quite easy, but then you have to bear in mind everybody else has got the same advantages. Okay? So how am I going to tell that you've got experience of caring for sick patients in a variety of settings? Well, from your application form. If you don't put that on your application form, I'm not going to shortlist you. You've got to think about it. You know, at the interview, you will have a questions about experience of taking charge. Yeah. So, when have you done that as an undergraduate student? When have you done that? What opportunity have you had? It could be being on the committee. It could. Have I misread something? No. No. I, I apologise. No. It's too late now. No. Out of the class. No. Yeah. Um, okay, so use this information to structure how you're applying. If you're using CVs, Make sure your, your CV fits the role that you're going for. So, for instance, when I left university, um, I was thinking, do I want to go to marketing? I didn't quite have the level of whatever it is to do that. Or do I want to go to human resources? I had CVs slightly tweaked to address each of those. Okay? So, think about that. Now, any questions so far? Oh. That's the application form, is it not the marketing? Yeah, this, this is the person specification they've got. Okay, so before I, before I do get... Um, for UE, okay, so the person specification I just put up <coughs> was an NHS one. It's very, very structured, okay? 
the UE version isn't quite so structured. And we've got significant guidance online for our managers who may be involved in recruitment selection. We also put them on a day-long training course to understand how best to apply the guidance. Okay? So in there it will talk about how it should be done, where it should be done, by whom. That's our sort of basic standard for what we want to see done. Um, I'm sure there's no reason why we shouldn't get some of this information available to you if it's of interest, just to give you a handle on the process. But just bear in mind, what, however we do it, it will always be managers manually reading through application forms. It's the only way we can do it at the moment. Okay, you could have it electronically. And I've seen, I think our front page says, do you meet the basic criteria for the jobs? And if you don't tick yes, you can't get on the application form. That actually quite works. Um, where that, sorry, yes, yeah. this. Where that talks to you, my handwriting is terrible. Absolutely terrible. So I was mature. Even if it's paper submitted, that had signed my application. Oh. I've also applied for a job that says you have to handwrite the application, which I thought was really dirty. So I made sure that when I sat it, I drafted it out first. I then made sure that I had the dictionary because the spelling's a bit lazy, because we all get used to uh, you, you know, uh, spell check and computers, and you draft it out before you send it in. Because as Dave said, you, know, you look at essential criteria, if you're not making essential criteria, you in the box, and you're not allowed to go further in terms of the job. As somebody who's sifting through that, if I can't read what you're trying to tell me, after a while I just give up trying and I don't take it any further, it might be the best application. But if it doesn't make sense and it's hard to read, I'll just give up. So make sure you don't give me the opportunity to not read the rest of your application. Really important. And things like spelling mistakes will make a difference. Absolutely. Um, okay. I'm happy to take any questions, but what I did think would be really useful for you uh, as a whole is if I could ask Rob to come out yeah. from the Careers Service. Now, well, uh, that's what he says on the team. This is pretty impromptu. I wasn't going to be speaking, and now I am speaking. So, hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Rob Ingram. Uh, I'm Deputy Head of Careers at UWE here. Um, I'm not going to talk really through CVs in any great detail, I think you'll all be uh, breathing a large sigh of relief about that. But what I will expe uh, talk about is a little bit about where you'll see careers throughout your UE education and how you can access some of the support online so that you can take that away and there's things that you can do yourself basically. So careers work with your curriculum teams in terms of curriculum design, so they'll be working first hand to, from the outset, make your degree courses a little bit more uh, professionally focused, uh, working so that you will uh, achieve those graduate attributes that you need to be able to get graduate level jobs. Um, and I think it's important to note CVs are kind of, when people think of the career service, CVs are the instant thing that pops into their mind. You do CVs, you do covering letters and you do applications. I just wanted to highlight that they're really the last loop in the, or the second to last loop in the chain really. Um, a CV, an application form, a covering letter are all really marketing documents that are trying to sell your skills, your attributes, your services to employers. So it's really important to unpick that you need to understand what your skills are and what the needs of your customers are. If somebody gave you a brief to write a marketing document for somebody and you didn't know what you were selling it, what you were selling, who you were selling it to, what the, what the needs of that customer were and what the demographic of that group was, you couldn't possibly sell it. And the same is true with applications, CVs, and covering letters. Um, and in a market where 70% of all graduates don't work in an area aligned to their degree, I think that's really important to contextualise. Even when you factor in nursing and law, that the majority of students aren't working in a direct vocational link through to what they're actually studying. You do need to have a really broad set of skills, and you do need to understand all those skills. So is everyone aware of InfoHub? Yeah, I apologise. <laughs> okay, but within InfoHub itself, on the front page, you'll now see a, th a little icon saying Career Toolkit. And if you click on that, you'll get put into this big resource centre here, which gives you loads of great tools. So when Stephen was talking about video interviews earlier, there's an interview simulator that you can go in, you can record yourself, it generates random questions for you, and you can play that back. There's elevator pitch builders, so you can go in and figure out best ways of introducing yourself psychometric testing so you can understand your skills, uh, personal resilience tests, 
um, motivational tests, things that will help you unpick those really core cool, important aspects that help you understand what you need, and then loads of company directories, uh, social media stuff that will help you to understand who you're selling your skills to. So that kind of combination of bits of knowledge and information. And if you go into this, this toolkit here, you'll be able to just work through, pick out relevant sections and kind of develop yourself, which is really the most important careers message that anyone at university can give you. It's absolutely your responsibility. No one is going to spoon feed in. No one's going to give you a job. So the sooner you kind of take ownership of that, the more successful you'll be. Hello. Why does it look like that? I'm sure I was in it yesterday. <laughs> you were in it yesterday? It didn't look like that yesterday. No, it's sh no, like oh, So you mean Info Hub or this? Yeah. So this is right. If I go to Info Hub, that's probably the easier way. If I work through, so if I log in, you'll see what I'm talking about. Hopefully, so yeah. So students, you wouldn't log on here. This is only when you graduate. If you're a student, you click on that very top button, or if you're a staff member, you click on that very top button. Um, and then you wouldn't then see this next screen. So, I, oh, you yeah, would so see I this see next that, screen. Then, then, like, then you click on that. this, and then that takes you through. So, no, I have seen that. I haven't clicked on it. I'm sorry. Right, there you go. That's how it will now. The next scene comes in my office. Yes. Get to work. Okay. Well, I'll kind of just leave it there, unless anyone's got any any other questions. Lovely. Okay. Thanks, Rob. I think. I just thought it'd be really useful for you guys to see where that lived and what it looked like on the basis of what you've had so far was effectively coming from the other side, but you need to understand what support's available to you from the university. And Rob and his teams are expert in that side of things. I was more looking at it from the mean employer who's going to find reasons not to select you. So on that basis, guys, any questions or comments or thoughts, or are we ready to move on into the next session? Yeah. Um, to what extent, if you if you if a, an individual meets the requirements, the person specification requirements, is it automatically that you have to go on to the next section? Are you sort of eligible to do that? Because I, I know that various times in my professional career, there have been people who yeah. met the criteria, and but you, know, you you might have lots of people meeting the criteria, and that whole filtering down process. Could you say something yeah. about the filtering down? Because oh. many people might meet. The yeah. Okay. We've got some fairly clear guidelines in how to handle um, the shortlisting process. The short answer at the moment, as I understand it, is that if you meet the essential criteria, we can then look at the desirable. Okay. And you can get to a place where you would have some reserves who maybe will just see the people who look like the best six, because we only six, see six people in a day, mm -hmm. and therefore you'd have two or three people as reserves. So people who meet the full uh, essential may not be shortlisted doesn't happen very often. There is something called the two tick scheme, which is something that we're working towards, where if people with a declared disability meet the essential criteria, they will be given an interview. So where you see the two ticks on company's adverts, that's what that means. We're in the process of moving towards that, but no, we don't have that as yet. And that's in part because many organisations are underrepresented by people with disability, in terms of staff with disabilities in their, in their reports. But if you take that a step further, as yeah. you're saying here, if I've got a job and I we know we want four, five, six people to be interviewed for that job, I don't know, there's about 50 people in this room, if all 50 meet the essential criteria, I'll, I'll go then to the desirable criteria. And if you all hit the desirable criteria, I'll go to what the narrative looks like. Because I know I only want five or six people. So I don't want to uh, I don't want to invite you to interview, putting you through a load of stuff. In fact, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we want the best person for the job. We don't want to put people through it. So, so one of the when you write the job application, read it through, make sure you've got the crucial flaws. Actually, get somebody to read it back to you. Because if you read it, you make sense to you because you spent ages writing it. But actually, if you read it for her, you think that bit doesn't make sense. You need to work that differently. And you'd be surprised how many times something you have written, when it's read back to you, doesn't make sense. The site that Rob showed you about going out and test, not just necessarily for your 
you're going in a, a, an adult nurse, you're not going to have to do some of the assessments and to worry about that got the psychometric testing. But for promotion, you might go and practice. I'm quite good at math, some whatever you want to call it. I know you laugh because of the good calculations. But when you put in a test centre environment where you have to analyse the budget, actually my mind goes back. So I make sure I go and I test things out. And there are actually no right or wrong rockets. It's not about that, it's about speed of analysis and what's it telling you and what's going to practice it. Practice your application. Do not ever submit the application three or four times for a different job. Somewhere within that you'll get a word wrong. You'll say, I've always wanted to work at Gloucestershire University and send it to me anyway. I'm really going to read the rest of that application. <laughs> and you'd be surprised. So make sure, even though the substance of it might stay the same, I think it's Dave or Rob time. You change bits of it, you make it real to the job that you're applying for. And that's what will make it different. After the essential, you go to the desirable. After the desirable, you go to the narrative. And increasingly, you'll do that, as Stephen talked about, without knowing certain characteristics. I've read applications not knowing your age, academic qualifications, and your gender. Sometimes some of that might be true of you, you know, uh, come through the application. So you're really reading it. Sort of cold. So you've got to make sure you're telling me the story. You want to tell me. So in this in this person specification, which is for a senior lecturer role at UWE, we're saying <coughs> it's essential that the person's got a PhD uh, and they've got evidence of CPD. It's desirable that they've got a teaching qualification and or fellowship of the uh, Higher Education Academy. So we've got 30 people that we're looking at. If all 30 have got the PhD, which isn't usual in nursing, to be honest, um, we'll then say, well, what about the second line? How do we... We winnow it down. We want a manageable number to, to make the best possible appointment that we can. And you know, let's be honest, the application form is you selling yourself to me in a way that makes me want to buy you for the organisation. You're going to come in through this door and give me what my job description says I need and my personal specification says I need. So you've got to think that if that's what you want to do. Right. Any other comments, questions, thoughts? Anybody still awake? Yeah. Okay. In which case, thank you all very much for your time. It's been great. Rob, thank you very much for your help with that. Appreciate it. And we're ready to go on with the next stage, Jerry, I think. I'm just going to organise now. Um, anybody who doesn't know me, my name is Jenny Dyer, I'm Director of Quality Learning and Teaching in the Faculty. We wanted just to finish up the day um, with the option of you actually self-selecting into groups, both staff and students, and to actually think about what you've heard today and actually what does it mean to you as an individual, partly maybe from a professional point of view, but actually really for you. So, you know, we know we've got adult nurses here, so there is something about being an adult nurse, parking the adult nursing part of it, and actually what makes you different from the next adult nurse. And we've come up with some bullet point questions, so in groups we're going to ask you to think about those from either your students' point of view or staff point of view. Um, we've allowed up to an hour for this and they're going to ask you to come back and we're just from each group going to give three headlines. I'm going to say so for each group. The rooms we've got there are 1B06, 1B27, 1C11 and this room here. Um, don't really mind where I could go. Libby, do you want to wave? Libby is one facilitator. So maybe Libby, if you'd like to go to 1B06 and if maybe could you follow Libby? Um, 1B27, um, Ada? Or would you rather stay here? Do you know roughly where to go for 1B27? I've got the nowhere to find it. Libby, can you point to uh, Ada in the directory 1B27? Yes, we'll go together then. Yeah. So it would be in the same sort of direction. Okay. Um, and maybe particularly our politics student might want to. Yeah. Certainly, Dawn, Ada. Um, I can tell you she's lovely. She really works hard and does stuff. 
Um, and then maybe in 1C11, if maybe Dave goes to 1C11 yep. with a group, and then we'll have the biggest group here, say with Kim and Rob and... <laughs> <laughs> and, and just just to really encourage you, we, I uh, I really want you to participate in this all from whatever constituency you represent. I really want you to tell us what it is you want us to shape for current and future curriculum. We've got a range of services and professional services from across the university. We think what we do is fabulous. Actually, if you're experiencing something else, you need to tell us. Our courses, our programs, are putting you in a place to go out and get these jobs that you want. You need to tell us. The program teams, academic teams, are not as confident about how we might incorporate some of these things in. We want you to tell us. Because otherwise, we'll keep thinking of the fact that I am the Joanna Woodman of our <laughs> Time past three at the moment. We make sure we're back by four at the very latest. If you do try that before they come back to the what we'd really like to do is put together out on a different route. We're going to collect all the papers in and, and find a way of getting them written up and make sure that we don't share them. We've got some contact emails from them. Um, so, and, and I know Ian has got to go first because she's got to shoot on. Uh, so, three things either from this session or from the day. Yeah, I think. Um well, I'll, I'll do a sum up from the day and also from the session. I think what was really useful in the session that we had students from different backgrounds. So we had adult nursing and we had politics and international relations. So very two different programs. But what we realized that um, the kind of skills that we practice throughout the programs are very similar as well. So, um, and what, what we've done, we actually try to answer the question. So we brainstormed the list of skills and attributes we thought employers are seeking, and we identified two specific skills, that, skills and that is uh, problem solving, communication, and creativity. Um, but then to answer the second question, we took an example of communication. So we focus on one specific skill, and we thought, how can we as graduates best evidence uh, that we possess those skills, and um, how they can be mapped onto the program. I think the, again, students responded quite nicely. We are held as well, we almost facilitated the response of our students, and we saw futures of work has come up. So, um, but also, uh, students talked about uh, the ability to present, and then that they get quite a lot of feedback, especially in adult nursing, uh, the right reflective logs. And um, it was quite interesting what they mentioned. They mentioned micro teach that is being assessed. And, and again, there is difference in terminology. So, my politics and my last student said, Well, what, what do you mean by micro teach? And then they explained. It's actually called simulation games in politics and by our program. <laughs> so that's, that's quite amazing. So we, we could map specific um, things that students do within our programs, which are quite similar. We just use different terminology for this. Um, but then we, we also looked at the, the question what skills and attributes are unique to our students. And, we are, and I thought this was quite incredible because we identified a few. Um, resourcefulness, uh, seeking opportunity, and also um, taking themselves out of their comfort zones. And I think that was quite important. And that was unique to our students that I spoke to today. And adaptability. And another thing that we came up with was foreign language. And if you could hear, I am, I am, I'm, English is not my first language. But as we talked about communication, it's not just the ability to communicate in foreign language, it's also about knowing the culture of the foreign language. So if something sounds very polite in Russian, it doesn't necessarily mean it will sound polite in English. And I think in the 21st century, 
employers, they would appreciate that. That's not just the level of the foreign language, it is about the your ability to understand the cultural context of the language that you are using. Um, and I think that what would stand as a student support um, from other graduates across the I guess across the country, but also across the world, because we live in a very globalized world, and I'm moving into my politics lecture. I'm not going to lecture again <laughs> about globalization. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and um, yeah, that would be my um, sum up of our discussion and of the day. Thank you. So you come to lunch and we have quite a lot of conversation. And uh, we talk to you about talk a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we paid to talk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure we, we solved anything, but we certainly had some really interesting discussions and covered quite a lot of ground. Um, I think one thing that came out very clearly was consistently we felt that the skills uh, and attributes that students are gaining through programmes, we could, as a university, could do more to um, translate what those skills mean into a workplace context outside of the university. So our language that we use in an academic sense, translating what those skills, attributes and language are in an external sense. And that, that seemed to come across quite strongly from everybody. Um, and we talked about lots of different things. We talked about uh, optional skills development uh, and how much impact that would have. We, we talked an awful lot about attendance and does mandatory attendance at workshops, lectures, seminars, is that an attribute of professionalism? So when you're out of the workplace, you're expected to be there regardless. If you don't turn up to a few lectures, no one really no one really minds. I mean obviously to a point and then there are interventions. But I think we can just clarify if you're an adult nurse don't listen to that because it's got you off all the time. Well if it's easy that is the point I think that's part of the point, isn't it? The professional body have articulated that attendance is a primary part of being professional. So should that be something that is across all, all, all subject areas? Um, we talk, in terms of specific skills, we talked about confidence, and that seems to be an area that we thought we could work soon to develop confidence more than we before. How to measure employability, how to determine what's worthwhile, staff development, how can we improve uh, staff development uh, to look at employability. Uh, are our assessment processes, um, could they be looked at to, we know they do imitate real world applications in a lot of circumstances, but in some circumstances like exams, they typically don't, you don't really do exams in the workplace, so um, do we sometimes take options for assessment that could be done in a different way and that be looked at. Else. Right, well, we have a, a group mainly of um, adult nursing students actually, but also representation from the library from Caroline from through the careers as well. Um, I think the key areas that came up and kept coming through, I mean, we identified a range of skills, I won't go through more, but the thing around authenticity and passion for what we're doing, whichever profession or whichever programme or course or environment you want them to, to be in, um, and also effective communication, not just good communication skills, effective communication skills, and our focus was particularly on, um, on, on adult nursing as an example in health and social care environments and how that communication, that different language and terminology has to be used depending on who you're actually communicating with and what the situation was as well. So that, I think we spent most of our time focusing on that. Um, but in addition, I mean, there was some discussion around how the programmes actually develop and support for skills, uh, and confidence came out very significantly there, confidence in practical skills as well as the transferable skills, um, and also developing flexibility and resilience. And again, the link there was around placements, and particularly if you're on a placement that's very different to your last placement and you don't like it that much. Um, was actually overcoming that to still continue with that learning experience to, to the, the benefit of yourself and the best you can make of it. Um, and around role modelling as well as mentors and practice educators as, as the importance of that role modelling in developing your own skills 
Um, and the focus in there was particularly around feedback and how feedback needed to be constructive and helpful and, and engaging and, and involving as well for that ongoing development. Um, I mean, we did talk about a few gaps and things that, that were identified, and I think in some cases it was around themes and links, um, perhaps. So it might be that some things are in existence there in the programme, but they're maybe not necessarily always the links are being seen. So I think that's an onus on us to look at making those things very um, uh, explicit uh, and clear for, for our students and for the staff as well. Um, we, I mean, the three key things for us that came up were um, actually the importance of having vision as to what it is you want to do and where it is you want to go. And it might be that that's not as clear at the moment at Level 3, but some people have a vision and an idea of where they want to go in their career and in their, in their employment, and others aren't quite so sure. But it's about taking steps sometimes um, into something that you might not be quite as interested in, but it might be a good springboard into where you want to go as well. So making those choices and the passion and the motivation to do that. It might well be that same experience is going on the placement that you're not really enjoying that much, but it's giving you all that you need knowing that it is a, a route to, to something else you want to achieve. Um, knowing yourself and self-awareness was, a, again, that came up with communication as well, actually, when we were discussing things. Um, who you are, because to be able to sell yourself to an employer, you need to know who you are. Because if, if you don't know yourself, you can't be genuine in that situation, and, and that's going to be picked up on. And also going the extra mile, and that was an example that, that came up for those people who've come along today, um, you know, that they're, they're willing to take those extra opportunities to go that extra mile because that passion is there. So all inter interlinked actually I think are the three key things. And we did have a fourth um, that was around can we have more opportunities like this um, for my students was those extra opportunities, those extracurricular opportunities looking at development uh, and particularly around employment that, that would be of help for those particularly who've got the passion and the desire to, to do those additional things rather than those that may be going through the motions. Does that catch yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Well, we, we had an exceptional group. We had the A team, so we covered off literally everything. <laughs> <laughs> Plus four. So well done, guys, to go for that. Um, we started off with a chat about how the afternoon had been, and actually, I sat at the back and thought perhaps it had been too wide a perspective, but actually, the, the guys felt it was really useful to see what's going on in the wider world, not just nursing and family nothing and having you know, questions on the post. So that was really considered useful. As Lydia and her group said, more of this sort of opportunity would be great. An opportunity to actually practice the skills. And there was some conversation, if I've understood it right, about child nursing getting in practitioners to do interviews. Is that right? Whereas we're not getting that. We had one interviews. We had a lecturer and a practitioner, but it's also because our students will be having to participate and do interviews to some of them. So they, they had to learn that. So it's an issue of scale, but wouldn't that be great for everybody to have that kind of opportunity? But how would you facilitate it? Yeah. But really, really useful sort of ideas there. Um, we then went off and had a really broad ranging conversation about a range of things. But for instance, talked a lot about the preparation. So when you see the job you want to go for, you prepare for it. You get to know the organisation you're going to. You maybe contact somebody in there to find out a bit more about it. You read the trust's mission statement. Sorry, we're going to concentrate a bit. Uh, nursing. Um, media and policy aware. So what's been in the press? Has there been something about what's going on in the local area that is of concern, is of use, is of interest? Why would you go to work in that particular trust that's been stated in the press? They're certainly going to ask you that kind of question. Okay. So preparing, um, understanding what that trust is all about, you have had experience of different work placements and you will like this trust as opposed to that trust or this department as opposed to that one. Think about preparing how you explain that in the interview, the application form, and question them at the end in that context. So I'm coming into you as a newly minted, newly qualified, what are you going to do to help support me? I understand, I don't know how you phrase this, there are significant questions about how nursing supervision is provided when you're in, when you're in your first job. Are there enough supervisors to help and support you? Questions like that, how are you going to be developed in your new job, they're really important. We looked at things like interprofessional working, we looked at things like drawing on your experience and pulling that out during the interview process, whether that's life experience outside of your chosen career and your time at university. So for instance, resilience, you all have had to show resilience in a variety of different situations to get where you are today. 
microcardial studies, microcardial placements, microcentric colony, and then large fragment studies including scout improvements of the metal or on camp. Think of the examples and explain them. And without fibbing, be prepared to big up and sell what you've got to offer. Don't lie about what you've done, because you will get caught out. And if you lie on application form, that can cost you your job and career. But do sell what you've done, take responsibility for it, and what you do makes you unique, what you bring to table makes you different. Sell that and um, really celebrate the successes. But best of luck, guys. Thank you. Okay. I think that covers all the groups. That was the and so I hope you found today useful. After this afternoon, it's all I have. We've, we've had lots of information shared with us from the university uh, perspective, from, from Jane Harrington, from uh, a more department focus and faculty focus than me. Uh, and as Stephen Isher would share, I think a really insightful and interesting national and international perspective. And, and the, if we're talking about employability, the one slide, we'll make sure they're all available and we'll get them shared. If you go back to there's a slide that Stephen shared, I mean, is where he his organisation, don't forget, they are the largest group of graduate recruiters. And okay, they might mainly represent finance and accountants and all, but it doesn't matter, it is exactly the same. And it was the slide about skills gaps. Mm -hmm. And it's where employers were saying, this is where we think some of the graduates are missing. You know, and, and the stuff in there wasn't about an ability to fill a care plan. Actually, it was about teamwork, it was about resilience, it was about presentation skills. So, so Lotte, our little paper nuke is grabbing me in here. Lotte, you might be saying, well, where does presentation skills come in? Actually, it comes in for an issue in a war round and a handover and a shift handover. And that's, that's a presentation. For the staff, what I put to you is, where do we effectively help students develop those skills on the same slide within the curriculum? Let's stand back. I said it, Jane said it, and importantly, Stephen said it, and we've all understood it. The subject specific knowledge actually is taken for granted. So, what do I, where do I help you develop the skills to present in a meaningful way? Where do I test that? Where do I encourage that and build that? So, just as a student colleague to us over here, and it's fantastic that Stephen <coughs> came and really tested my thinking. I challenge the academic colleagues in our curriculum where we go. I hope it's been useful. Huge thank you to Tom at the back. He's rarely this quiet over the length of the <laughs> an afternoon. Uh, through Tom's good efforts, we'll make sure this is available and, and, and uploaded uh, onto a lecture capture site for media site. We'll make sure you get the link. And two other people, apart from Stephen and Jane, who aren't here, Dave, who presented, Rob, who chipped in as well. Two people really